what Wendy and I are going to talk about today combines uh, sort of the grand, far future vision of what AI can do for virtual worlds, why that's important for AI, and why it's important for virtual worlds, and then also some nearer term projects that the Electric Sheep Company and Novamente are working on together now, involving experimenting with AI controlled virtual agents in Second Life and other virtual worlds. One of the main arguments I want to make in this talk is that AI and virtual world, and I'll go over what that means in, in more detail, but it, it's an important point. We're not just looking at automated agents that carry out simple scripts that are put in there in detail by a programmer. You're looking at agents that explore the world, perceive the world, flexibly act in the world, and can surprise even their creators by doing things that they have figured out how to do on their own, through their interaction with the world mm -hmm. and through their interaction with the, the human being. General intelligence, such as a human, can solve problems which didn't even exist when it was created. The problems that we all solve in the world today, many of them were problems that didn't exist when we were born. Mm -hmm. In the same way, an AGI system launched in the virtual world may be able to deal with situations that came about in that virtual world long after the programmers wrote it and, and went off to do something else. This is a kind of adaptiveness which is quite different than what I call a narrow AI system. A narrow AI system being a program that does some particular task, which people generally consider as robotics is necessary to create an AI. Some people think you don't need any kind of embodiment at all. You can just have something like Google that you interact with with text, and it can eventually learn to become the smartest human or smarter. My only way of thinking is that virtual embodiment is a kind of nice middle ground. Because I've, I've done enough robotics to become annoyed with the process of soldering things together and dealing with sensor and actuator problems. And then once you build a robot, it's just there in your room. You have to be a Sony or a Honda to make a huge number of robots and send them all over. And even those companies have sort of put the brakes on their humanoid robotics efforts just for economic reasons. In the virtual world, you have a body for your AI, you have perception, you have action, linguistic communication, socialization. You don't have to solder things together, you don't have short circuits, and once you've made your AI a body, it's quite simple to replicate it millions of times, send it all over to experience millions of things at once, interact with millions of different people. We started experimenting with this within uh, Novamente, my AI company, during 2005 and 2006. We were working with a game engine called Crystal Space, which is an open source game engine. We use our AI to control the, the little guy you see up there. Our human is controlled, human controls the big guy. And the little guy walks around controlled by Novamente, and the big guy tries to teach him stuff. In this particular simulation, all we were trying to teach him was that if you put something in a box and shut the lid, the thing is still going to be there when you open up the box, like the public virtual world. 3D virtual worlds, such as Second Life, and also two-dimensional virtual worlds, to the extent that they're rich enough and have enough diversity of objects, environments, and then human beings in them. You have the experience of embodiment, and you have a massive plus. You have hundreds of thousands to millions of teachers who, by interacting with the AI, AI will help the AI to learn. And this really leads us up to the project that Novamente and the Electric Sheep Company are now playing with together. We decided to start out with virtual animals in virtual worlds. And this is something that others have played around with a bit before. We can see here on, on this slide some virtual pets that exist in, in Second Life. Now, these basically <coughs> carry out a, a fixed set of behaviors that is specified by the programmers. Then the human pet owner can kind of write a macro on the command line to combine those behaviors into a more complex behavior. What we're looking at is creating a virtual animal in Second Life that's a little more flexible. It can learn new behaviors beyond the inbuilt list of behaviors that it's given. It can learn them both through interacting with humans, and I'll show some specific examples of that a little later. 
and just on its own, through exploring around in the world, trying to achieve its, its own goals, like getting food and water and just entertaining itself. Obviously, virtual dogs, monkeys, turtles, whatever other animals we choose to create, this is not the end game. We want to go from there to humanoid babies, children, humanoid avatars that can talk, interact, carry out useful functions. The idea is to start out simple, let the creatures get smarter and smarter through learning. As they get smarter and smarter, you can wrap them in different bodies and have them serve a variety of, of different functions. One of the things I'm most excited about doing a little further down the road is a, is a talking parrot. I think uh, language learning is, is maybe one of the most exciting things you can get from the millions of teachers that AI will have in, in a virtual world. If you create a virtual talking parrot, which has the ability to speak rudimentary English, but also, most critically, the ability to improve its knowledge of English based on feedback. If you have a lot of people interacting with these things, I can see potential for the linguistic ability of these birds to increase very rapidly based on the feedback gathered from the general culture of, of, of second life. But this is a, a project where we're very interested in, in doing as well. There's a lot of ways it could be met now about what good AI is from a virtual world perspective. And after that, we'll get into some of the concrete and specific things we're working on right now. Hi, I'm Wendy Cornish with the Electric Chief Company. And I'm going to talk a little bit about where we see the value in AI as it, as it relates to virtual worlds. One of these agents to play a game. It could be any game you want. It could be hopscotch or chess, or it could be a game that you make up. So um, it, it gets to be a lot more complex and a lot more interesting. And finally, throughout all this, there's going to be enough intelligence that these agents can actually become your friends. And where there are a lot of spaces that are built in, on virtual world platforms, um, some of them are very interesting, and some of them are interesting but empty um, because there's a, there's a bill, but not necessarily things going on. Um, sometimes people are holding events or staffing this space to make it more exciting, but that's very expensive. Um, so one of the things that intelligent agents will enable us to do is have staffing at, in these places that will add another dimension to the places and make them more interesting for people in the commercial world to be a conduit of information in a way that they aren't quite at this time. No one is the world leader in artificial general intelligence and they build the systems that learn through and get smarter through experience. And we are a leader in building technology and experience that, experiences that enhance the virtual world. Uh, we're really focused on, on knowing where the holes are and how we can fill them. We're trying to bring out new products um, that really help bring virtual worlds to the mainstream. So it makes a lot of sense for us to work together on this effort. Um, and, and we're working on bringing AI into virtual world, 